microphone. What am I printing? I got it right here, Max. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. I need a drink. Discussion about some simple electronic physics that you probably didn't learn in school, and the biggest reason that people cannot replicate any of Stan Myers' stuff is because of what you learn. In my opinion. No in the grass. So the live stream should be running if it goes blank, if someone could touch the mouse. I don't know why it does that, but I don't know. So if we have potential differences, if we have a plate and a plate, you have on one side, you have a positive and a negative. The big question is, why would you have a positive and a negative on plates? Naturally occurring, just two plates in the air, two plates underwater. Two plates with any substance in between, if it's a non-conductive substance, then it will naturally want to have a positive on one side and a negative on the other side. Now, the reason is, anything that fills this space, if it's conductive, then you have a ground short between the two. If you have a ground short, you have no positive or a negative. If, if this substance is non-conductive, that means it's an insulator. If this is an insulator, and this plate is slightly different than this plate, it will naturally form a positive and a negative. If this is a dielectric of some kind, and this is a positive and a negative potential, what do we have? Anybody? Capacitor. Close. I was going to say capacitor. <laughs> Me too. Wrong. <laughs> but right. Okay, that sucked. What do you want to hear? A charge? You got a stored charge? Is that what you want to hear? Exactly. Okay, well, speak American. A battery. Okay. A battery. Okay, if you have a semiconductive material that is semiconductive, meaning maybe some of it conducts, maybe some of it's an insulator, you have, could have a semiconductor, you could have, forgive me, I'm tired. <laughs> the balance of four electrons. Semiconductor or a semi, Dielectric. Yes. Semi-dielectric, semi-conductive, it's the same thing. Okay, if you have air, you have paper, you have oil, cockroach wings. Barium titanate. <laughs> Barium titanate. Remind me of that in a few seconds. That's a good one. I'm sorry? That's Glass. Remind me of the barium titanate. Glass. Glass. 
An insulator is only an insulator with holes in it. Everything has holes in it. If you have glass or anything else, it's either a semiconductor or a semi-dielectric, which is an insulator. As long as you have a dielectric, you have a capacitive effect. Okay, if you have a capacitive effect, it's not exactly a battery. It's not exactly a capacitor. A battery is partially a capacitor. A capacitor is partially a battery. Capacitor batteries, they're very similar. They both hold a charge that you can use to do something with. So, let's say we have two plates and we have a car battery. If it's dry and I hook my meter to a car battery, there's no acid in it, no liquid. Do I get a voltage? Yes. Chanson is correct. Because the air is a semiconductor, semi-dielectric. But no current. How are the ions passed? Not exactly true. Okay. Capacitor stores what? Static volt stores voltage. Where is the current? Not till you discharge. When you discharge it, you now have a dumped current. There will be a flow. A flow is current. If you have voltage, which is not exactly current, agree? Anybody yes. argue with that? And make sure to say that voltage is just a, by definition, is a difference in potential, and that's it. So, if we have potential, if we have, just have two plates, <coughs> back to the battery before I get to that. Once I put acid, or an alkali, or an acid, into the battery. How many volts is now on the battery? 1.5 with one cell. If it's a car battery, how many volts did I just make as soon as I put the liquid in? If you have six cells, you're going to have 12 volts. Chance it is correct. It is automatically 12 volts and how many amps, Chanson? Depends, Depends on the on size the of the plates. The Depends on the size of your battery amperage capacitors it depends on the size of your capacitor so once you put the battery acid in the battery you now have 12 volts at let's say a thousand amps science tells us this is a chemical reaction now let me define a chemical reaction a chemical reaction is when you take two chemicals and mix them together, they react until they're gone. They change into something else, correct? What did the battery change into? A battery. It's a potential, right? So we now have a battery that has a plus on one side, plus on this side, a minus on this side. We now have a battery. This is not a chemical reaction. Not a chemical reaction. This is chemical. The chemicals are ionic charge. Positive and negative charge stored in a vessel. The charge is actually stored on the plates. A battery, a capacitor stores the charge in the dielectric, is that correct? A, a capacitor stores charge in the dielectric, is that correct? It's, I think it's passed through the dielectric and it's stored on the plate surface. The man is absolutely correct. You have a dielectric here. The voltage is actually stored here on the plate. The dielectric is just a semi-resistance between the plates. Agreed? Someone touch the mouse pad for me, please. Hunter, that's your new job. 
Don't ask me why it does that. I don't know. So, now the battery chemical reaction is actually chemical storage as ionic charge. Positive ions, negative ions. If you have a battery, the plates actually have little holes in them. And these holes actually add up more charge to be in the hole, more surface area for the holes. So if you have a capacitor with a dielectric in it, does it hold a charge? Yes. Where the capacitor holds the charge on the plates, the battery holds the charge on the plates, correct? Until yes. it's shorted out. Any medium in between is either a semiconductor or a semi-dielectric. Does that make sense? I don't like that you use the word semiconductor. They just call it a dielectric because semiconductors like a diode is a semiconductor, a transistor is a semiconductor. Okay, let's take what Ed just said. He's jumping ahead on me. No, I'm just trying to get prepared. That's there. okay. <laughs> let's say we have a piece of gold foil, Ed, and there's a bunch of little pinholes in it. Will one side hold a charge and the other side hold a charge, a different charge? If it's in a glass Possibly jar. Possibly a positive yeah. in one side and a negative on the other side? I'm talking about a very old experiment, I would say yes. What is this thing I just described? Uh, it sounds like a Leyden jar or the other uh, do the main thing with Jake. Transistor. Gold. One side is a negative, one side is a positive. A diode and a transistor the transistor is two diodes. Excellent. Very well said. The first transistor was what, Ed? <clears throat> a germanium. Uh, and germanium. Germ right. Germanium diode. Is that right? Germanium? Ger yeah. Germanium diode. Most of you are not old enough to know what a germanium diode is, I bet. The first radios used a germanium diode, which had a rock with with a needle point on the rock. You move the needle around until you found a good signal on your radio. It was called a cat's whisker radio. Also a point contact diode. Point contact diode. And like you said, in a cat's whisker. So, back to our plates. If we have a point contact, more or less, one wire in the middle of the plate, we have a capacitor or a battery, right? Right. We have ionic charge of a positive or a negative. So if this plate you put battery fluid in a battery, it's automatically full charged, right? No, you've got to charge it. You have to you put the sulfuric acid in there, you have to put, you, you put a charge on it. It is automatically 12 volt. You so charge it to... Volts, but you're, not, you're still going to have to get the, electro, the process going, the chemical reaction going. Once you dump the fluid in, it becomes 12 volts. Yes. You have to condition it by charging it. Correct. Correct? Yes. But it already has 12 volts in it, right? Yes, you'll have 12 volts. You have to train it to hold a charge. You have to train it to hold a charge. So, the reason we're talking about this is Sam Meyer's work. What was every, every part of his work? What are we all after? Efficiency. Two plates with voltage in between it. Two plates with voltage in between it with water as the dielectric. Oh, okay. And what's another name for a water fuel cell? A wa uh, the water capacitor. Water capacitor. That's another name for a water water fuel cell. It's and he calls it that in an international patent. So if you want to make Stan Myers's process, you have a dielectric between a capacitor. So where do we get the charge from? 
the battery. High voltage pulse trans. I think it travels on the surface of the water. The elect free electrons are ionized on the surface of the water and travel over to the plate. I think you're all partially right. So, if we just dump water into this thing, we're going to get maybe 1.2 volts between each plate, two plate to set. We have to get a lot more voltage across the plates. How do we accomplish that? Battery acid is a good conductor and you pass amperage when you have a conductor. We don't want to pass amperage. We want to limit the amperage as much as, much as possible. So if we dump a conductive fluid like battery acid into this thing, we get a dead short. What are the bubbles that you get when you're charging the batteries? That is hydrogen. Wow. <laughs> When you're charging a battery in your car, it outputs hydrogen gas, which is flammable. That's why if you're smoking, you light your, you light your lighter so you look down in the battery, it blows up in your face because hydrogen and oxygen, you just lit it. So, back to the barium titanate. Barium titanate is what they put in supercapacitors. Do you know why? It resonates naturally with the environment. The service area is really high. Very high dielectric constant. Barium titanate is, I'm not even going to explain where they get that. It, it's a, we won't go there. Is it silver oxide barium titanate? Either way. Okay. Barium titanate is used in supercapacitors because you can actually form what's called a Helmholtz layer in the barium titanate. The Helmholtz layer is a multi layer which will store a charge. You just get more, basically, you have more layers for with the barium titanate. And then a capacitor, you can add a number of plates. A battery, you add a number of plates. It's basic physics, it's real stuff. So, any questions on that part? Okay. So let's say we have our two plates over here. This is our Stanmeyer plate cell device. So we can read into Stan's stuff, and we know historically he said a square wave oscillation, correct? He specifically says around five kilohertz. At a 50% duty cycle. At a 50% duty cycle. What we just said was there's 5,000 of these pulses in a certain amount of time. And at a 50% duty cycle, the on time is the same as the off time. Questions on that? Everybody follows that? So, the on time is on the positive side of a zero. This is zero volts. Negative side would be down here. So the reason I mentioned the positive side, where is the negative? Anybody know? In the ether. It's in the off time when you're not pulsing it. I believe the man's right. Yeah. This is our battery again. The positive and the negative. Wait a minute, who is right? You! Oh, I 
thought he was right. What's your name again? <laughs> David, uh... Pakta. Pakta? What kind of name is Pakta? Fucking Polish. Polish name. I love Austria. Poland. Good. I'd like to get a Poland. Uh, Buy me a ticket. You can't get a cup of coffee. They lost the water for... So! Resting ...for boiling water. <laughs> so, the big question here. <laughs> If you have positive on one side and negative on the other side, if I take these wires and touch them together, what happens? You clench your nuts. <laughs> what happens if I touch this wire to one terminal to another terminal on a car battery? You get a radiant wind or a short. It's going to burn. It's going to melt. It's going to burn your fingers bad. Where is the part that burns first? The least resistant. The least resistant. Where is the least resistance? Exactly in the water. In the water. The weakest point in the water. Weakest weakest point weakest in the water. Let's say the, the wire theoretically is completely equal conductivity in diameter. Where does it melt first? Exactly in the middle. Push the I apologize. Bakta. Exactly in the middle, he says. Other than David, who knows why that would melt in the middle? Why can't I answer? Come up here and you can answer. No, I'm going <laughs> Other than David, why would it melt in the middle? Because two equal opposing forces, so you have Equal forces. Because, equal forces because we have a negative potential and a positive potential that are equal. So it's going to meet in the middle, correct? Yes. Weakest point is going to melt. If there's no weak point, it would melt in the middle. Are we agreed? This is not what we learn in school. What happens if you hold the wire? towards one side of the other. You, you get a nice nifty yeah. burn mark that you live with the rest of your life. It didn't melt there first. Yeah. <laughs> Most likely it'll melt pretty easy. Theoretically, so that it's easy to understand, it's going to melt in the middle because two charges meet. I, I get that. I was wondering what happens to all this. The, the electricity does not flow from the negative to the positive. It does not flow from the positive to the negative. It flows equally to the middle because we have a potential difference equal. Now, back to the square wave. Positive potential. We're on the positive side of zero volts. All of Stan's work was positive side of the zero volts. If any of the paperwork you read, it's always positive potential, correct? Positive waveform. Every time you look at Stan's stuff, he talks about positive waveforms. But he never uses the word. He always calls them unipulses. Unipolar pulse strain. Right. Unipolar, meaning above the zero mark. Not AC, DC, not, not, not queer. Okay. <laughs> so, if we take this positive potential and we put it on just this plate, positive, Let's just assume there's no negative just for ease of operation. If there's no negative connection and we give it from somehow, we give it positive potential on one plate, what happens to the negative plate? Gets the negative potential? How? Um, are, the, are the wires hooked up? Let's pretend theoretically not hooked up. Where does the negative potential come from? I don't know. Where? You want to say your arbitrary ground? 
It would, yeah, it would be. It would be creative. Let's so. just put the ground to dirt. Yeah. Where does the, where does the negative? What what happens to the negative plate? Did someone touch the mouse? What happens at the negative plate with the dirt, with the ground? Will it equalize? Will there be a negative potential form? Yeah. Yeah, the, the positive plate will suck a negative, uh, negative charge up to that other plate. If you put two plates together and one plate is negative, one plate is positive, it will equalize and the other plate will match, The both plates will match. They will equal out, Potent, equal potential. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we can make a positive pulse and we can hit the plates with a positive pulse, we're going to automatically get a negative, right? I think so. I think makes common sense, right? Generate makes perfect common sense. I didn't understand. I, well, I heard that like a so magnet automatically has a negative side to it. So I, I figure if you have a positive, you got to have a negative. If we took a cat and we take a comb and we run that comb through that cat, what happens to the comb? Well, becomes statically charged. Statically charged. Positive and negative? No. 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 Where is the other charge? In the air. In the air. What if we have lightning? Does lightning strike from the cloud to the ground or from the ground to the cloud? From the ground to the cloud. In the path of least resistance. Yeah, goes either way. <laughs> Why does lightning strike? And that guy is right. Because Why does lightning strike? Because the potential is so large that it has to overcome the dielectric. I'm sorry, David, what? Because the energy comes from the ground state first, splits the dielectric, giving a path for the positive ionosphere to attract to the ground for seconds. So the ionosphere is positive and the ground is negative? Correct. So the ionosphere, ion, the sphere is positive, the ground is negative. Once the potential is m met for the arc to cross the two, then you have lightning bolt. But from the space shuttle, you do see occasionally lightning does strike up into outer space. Because if you have a negative potential higher than the positive potential, then the lightning bolt would go up. If the positive potential is greater than the negative potential, the lightning bolt will go down. No, that's Reagan in Star Wars killing all those. That's what you see. So, if the ionosphere and the Earth were equal potentials, then, then theoretically the lightning bolt would meet in the middle. Right? And the air in the Earth would be a dielectric. Semi-permeable dot, semi-permeable dielectric. But you're missing something. Yes, you're Dave. missing a very important point. Yes, Dave. Is is they can't? They're not easy. I'll say this as clearly as I possibly can. They're not equal in potential between the Earth and the ionosphere, because the ionosphere is at trillion volts we talked about volts versus frequency earlier on it's a higher frequency and the earth is a lower frequency so the potential is higher at the ionosphere and the frequency is lower at the earth so the potential of the earth its frequency is lower but the mass of the earth is greater so that you have to take frequency potential and mass to understand that equation that's why lightning comes down to the mass, because the mass has a void. The higher the frequency, the less room there is to expand that. The Earth has a bigger mass, but the void in the middle of those masses is greater, so that's where the energy goes into. So, he's went way past the basic okay, explanation. Got, sorry. You, you have that's this. okay. Everybody's, most people are familiar with the Jacob's Ladder. 
Jacob's and, ladder. Right. And he's Jacob's saying, ladder, two antenna, a lightning bolt in between. And as the and when and it climbs up until the space is so far apart that the spark can't jump anymore and it stops and then this it, it repeats. But the way I'm looking at lightning is you have the clouds that are rubbing together, producing a static charge. This charge builds up to a point where it can reach a voltage potential high enough to release or discharge. And then it's gonna go ahead and ionize the air until it gets to the ground path to, you know, to, to uh, release its energy. So I'm looking at, as, as the lightning, exceeding a charge level that it can't hold anymore, or until it breaks, or ionizes the air to make hey, a path. Wait, wait a minute, Jansen, wait a minute, Jansen. That last part, say it again with the microphone. You have the clouds rubbing together with moisture, and then there's like the comb through the air. It's accumulating a charge. The charge gets so big, and then it's able to go when the charge potential gets great enough, it can start to ionize the air molecules to make a path to come to come to ground and go out. So in essence, what Ed Jansen just said, you have a potential difference once the dielectric ionizes the lightning strikes. Everybody understands that? Do we agree, David? No. That's tough. You're, you're halfway right. What you're missing is the energy that comes from the ground state up to split the dielectric of the air. Either way, the energy has to reach a potential to split the air. Correct. Yes. That's the, the point. You, you can go in more in depth here in a minute because I'm getting really sleepy. Well, good. Just keep going because what you're doing is you need to make an electromagnetic claim and I'm going to make a gravitational claim and then we'll put the two together. All right. Fair you'll enough. see that they, they are always together. I would have to agree on that. You fair better. Enough. I'm going home. True. You're going home anyway. It's true. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow he's going home. So... The Stanley Meyer circuit, if you understand that you, we are making a potential difference between a dielectric fluid. Water, according to Stan, was what, 84 points? Yeah, 80 ohms of, uh, of resistance. But I don't know the how- The dielectric constants, right. constant was 84, right? Are you there. able to find that in any books? Yes. If you look, research dielectric constant, 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 the dielectric constant of water, you'll find out that the, the dielectric constant changes from distilled water, tap water, anytime you add something to the water, the, water, the dielectric changes. So, the reason we're talking about it, lightning and dielectrics and charges. Stan put a positive charge onto the blade, okay? Since he put a positive ionic charge, automatically this thing will create a negative ionic charge. Thank you. Automatically. So, this is a potential, positive potential. This is a negative potential. Positive potential, negative potential. And we just agreed that once these two potentials are great enough, you have a dead short. You have a lightning strike. Dead short condition, correct? Right. So, the dielectric medium affects when that dead short will have it. So if this potential, in reality, okay, then why doesn't lightning stop between the ionosphere and the ground if the potential is equal? Yeah. 
Say it again. Okay. Then why doesn't the lightning stop between the ionosphere and the ground if the potential is equal, like the wire getting hot in the middle? Because once you reach a dead short, the potential is momentarily lost. If you have a potential of positive and negative, once this shorts across, you have a dead short, you no longer have these potentials. If you reach a dead short, you have no potential. But you have current flow. You have current flow. And I advise, I, another way to go ahead and talk about that lightning you might go ahead and say when the air is ionized that you have a dielectric breakdown. Yes, the dielectric breakdown would be a dead short. Okay. So, if you have a dead short, you have no potential. All you have is current flow. Current flow is basic electrolysis. If you add this potential and this potential up far enough, the more voltage you store, voltage is potential. The more voltage you store on the plates, these potentials grow. Okay, no matter how perfect these plates are spaced apart, eventually when the potentials grow, they contact. As soon as they contact, it's a dead short condition. If we have a dead short, we have basic electrolysis. Everyone agrees on that? So, if we pulsate this and make one side positive and one side negative, and we never reach the dead short, then we have a voltage reaction, correct? as long as we keep the potentials apart, one's over here, one's over here, just only dielectric in the middle, you will not get a dead short condition. If you do not get a dead short condition, you make hydrogen with voltage only. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody disagree with that? It's common sense physics, correct? If, with a dead short, you say? No dead short. No dead short. Only voltage. Right. Well, voltage positive on one side, negative on the other side. Only <coughs> voltage potential. Well, it, I, I would say you have to pulse it. Give it a pulse. We're getting to that. Okay. So if you have a capacitor, a capacitor stores potential energy, right? Yes. You'll find that one in your textbooks. If you have a capacitor, the dielectric is a plastic polymer and an oil paper. The dielectric is your insulator. Insulator, which is what? The dielectric. Correct. So, water has a dielectric constant of 84. Paper has a dielectric constant. Oil has a dielectric constant. Distilled water? Distilled water has a different dielectric constant than tap water. You can find dielectric constants for all kinds of water on the internet. You can find it for paper. It's capacitor physics. So, a capacitor stores charge, which is a voltage potential. There's only amperage flow when there's a dead short. As soon as there's a dead short, there's no more potential difference. As long as you do not dead short the cell, you now are making hydrogen with voltage. Okay? That makes sense. Yes. Perfect sense. Yes. Easy to understand, right? Yes. If the potential touches, you have a dead short. If you have a dead short, you're just, that's all you got. You, you got a battery making hydrogen with amperage. So, how do I know how much voltage this thing can hold? by the potential that can be held on the two plates without touching, correct? Make sense? I would say by, by the bubbles you make. We're not even getting to the bubbles. Oh, yet. okay. <laughs>
voltage potential on a multimeter or an oscilloscope, correct? Your voltage potential is going to be dependent on how good your dielectric is. Yes. The dielectric constant is how much voltage potential can be held in that dielectric. So if you have a dielectric constant of 84, that tells you roughly the voltage you can hold between the, the, the plates. So that being said, if you take a capacitor head, there's oil capacitors, there's barium titanate capacitors, there's all kinds of different capacitors, mylar film. There is a voltage potential difference in, in that dielectric constant. We figured that out, right? Right, polyester gap, of, anyway, yes. So, if you have a capacitor, what are they marked as? Voltage, am I right? When Every you, capacitor has a voltage, has a voltage marked rate, on the right. capacitor. Right. If you design circuit, I'm sorry, yes? It also has to do with the polling capacity of the electrons in the plates. Because yes. if the polling capacity is, the plates are similar, you will get less voltage. If they are a material that, that is a bigger potential differential, you get more voltage. Hold that thought. Don't let me forget. Don't let me forget. So, Let's say you have a capacitor that's rated at 100 volts and you're designing a circuit. I design a lot of circuits myself. If I have a 12 volt circuit that's designed for 12 volts, I need a minimum of a 24 volt capacitor in the circuit. Why? Because what happens if I go over 24 volts on that 24 volt capacitor. It blows up. Why? Ground short. You just ground shorted the capacitor and you blew it up. So if you have dielectric breakdown, you just dead shorted. Yes, is that agreed? You dead shorted with dielectric breakdown at the voltage, the voltage marked on the capacitor. Did you make any hydrogen? Yes. Before it blew up. At the moment it blew up, it was a dead short which ignited the hydrogen. Do you think that's what happens in Stanley Myers itself? I'm going to say no. If at that moment you had a dead short in Stanley Myers itself, would it blow up? If he drove down the road, it didn't blow up. No. So, with the dielectric constant of water, we can roughly figure the voltage potential that we can have in our standby cell, which is a semi, semi dielectric, which is also a semi conductor. You can't have one without the other. One is the same as the other one. So, back to the hydrogen making. If a capacitor is rated for 100 volts, it will blow at 100 volts. If a capacitor is rated for 10,000 volts, it will blow at 10,000 volts. So you have to design a circuit. You use twice the voltage on your capacitors for a circuit so it doesn't blow up. Does that make perfect sense? Twice or, is that just twice or more. Twice. Minimum of twice in case there's uh, transients in the circuit. There's various reasons you can have transients in the circuit. But what if you're trying to resonate the cap? Then doesn't it have to be exactly the right? It should be more like. In order to resonate a capacitor, you have to have an inductor on the other side. Right, but we're, I mean, we're not getting in onto that. Yet. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's a good question. In order to resonate a capacitor, you have to have inductance to go with the capacitor. Well, I was talking about really the voltage, but that's all we'll, right. we'll get to that. Okay. Actually, I might let David angle with that, that one. Okay. So, we understand if you have a ground short, it blows up, right? We don't want it to blow up because we want it to blow up in the engine. 
So if you put too many volts to this thing, you're going to over ionize the dielectric and it's going to blow up. We don't want to put too many volts in it. There has to be a certain amount of voltage in there to make the maximum amount of hydrogen without a ground sort. Once you ground sort, you have Faraday electrolysis. If you do not ground sort, you do not have Faraday electrolysis. If you do not use a conductive fluid, your chances of not dead shorting have went up. So if you use water, which is not really that conductive, but it is some, semi, it's a semiconductor. So. It's perfect. Can you say it's reason it's because it's a semiconductor because you broke the covalent bond? And the, uh, so now the, uh, the amount of electrons you have has changed, and that's why it can fit the definition of a semiconductor? I don't believe I'm going to go in the, into that in okay. today. Maybe later. Because the, the point that I'm trying to I'm too tired, Ed. Okay. If I try to go in depth, I'm really going to mess up, and someone's going to really make fun of me. We're going to keep it simple today. Who could that be here locally? You can, you can make fun of me all you want, David, because I don't care. I love you too, Billy. And I'll second it that anyone on this planet can make fun of me. I don't care. You can make fun of me if you want. It's all right. You're an all right guy. <laughs> so, where were we at? Uh, too much voltage. Yeah. So, back to component values. Every component has a value. If we have a capacitor, we have a value on that component. If we have a diode, we have a, we have a value on the diode. Every component has a value. If you exceed the value, chances of it exploding is very good. So if we have a component that's 600 volts, what do you think that circuit's designed for? Less than 600. For sure. Probably 300. That's a good guess. Less than 600. So if any component of your circuit is at one voltage, your circuit is designed for less than that component. The weakest link in the chain is what breaks. What, you said something before. What, what was it? I told, so, I told somebody to remember something. What was it? Pulling, pulling of the material. Pulling of the material, that would be how much fits into that material? That's correct. Okay. So you need. Basically, he said if you have a wire, you have a certain amplicity of the wire. You have a, a load for that wire. So, if I told you I had a 5 amp load, how big a, wa a wire should I use? You can look it up on a chart. Yes. Roughly 20 gauge, 19 gauge, I think that's right. You look it up on a the chart, there's all kinds of charts. If you're dealing with coiled wire, look up the Tesla people. They've already done all kinds of research on coil wires. It's different than the amplicity of a straight wire. You need saturation. Right, you need saturation with the amperage. What happens with the voltage? Goes down. That's a, that's a trick question. Voltage, if it stays the same, neutralizes or goes down. <laughs> If, who's familiar with Romex wiring for your house? Anybody? I am. It's a 600 volt dielectric on the insulation. Wow. Chance had just said Romex wiring for your house. Your house is wired for 120 volts basically. Romex has a dielectric breakdown of 600 volts. Why would you have a dielectric breakdown on two wires in a strand? Because you have two wires with a dielectric in between. They run in parallel and they have rubber around them. The rubber is now your dielectric. So, if the voltage rating for a dielectric breakdown of wires is 600 volts, 
What's that mean? It takes 600 volts to get a dead short. Exactly. It takes 600 volts to get a dead short. The dielectric is now worth 600 volts. You have two wires with rubber around it. The dielectric breakdown is 600 volts. How did the 600 volts go through the rubber? Uh, from a transformer. So, so if I go over there and that wire is plugged in and it's creating 300 volts. 300 is half of 600, right? Yeah. So where's the 300 volts hanging out at? In the dielectric, right? Uh, no, on the, on the copper. On the copper or in the copper? On the copper. Skin effect. Look up skin effect, frequencies and skin effect. Once you fill copper wire with amperage, you can increase the speed of that voltage and make a skin effect. Basically, amperage is the speed of power through copper, aluminum is the ion exchange, a domino effect through the copper wire. So if you look up, take the voltage, where is the voltage hanging out? on the outside of the wire. If 600 volts is the dielectric breakdown of room X wire, and I put 600 volts in there, it's going to dead short through the rubber, right? Right? Yes. Right. Makes awesome perfect fire. sense. So, the voltage threshold for breakdown for room X wire is 600 volts. If we take a water a water cell and take the dielectric of rubber and put it in the cell, we can now figure out the dielectric breakdown in between the plates, right? Yes. Sir, you got to add ambient temperatures. You got to yes. add moisture in the air. You yes. got to add pressure. Yes. Every, all of that adds to the dielectric constant. To so the dielectric breakdown. Yes, which would be dielectric constant between the two conductive surfaces. Air pressure, altitude, vacuum, everything adds to that. Anytime you look up, let's say the room X, 600 volts, that's to a certain altitude, a certain barometric pressure, all that stuff that he just said. Water saturation of the conductive material, the dielectric. So. Including the amperage. I think that the 600 volts is a common amperage including there on watts because you can put 600 volts through a wire and not get it to short but the amperage has to be up enough to make the dielectric jump yes and no if you have high tension wires through the air and you have to work on those high tension wires and the helicopter comes up to it they have to take a grounding rod and touch the wires before the helicopter gets up close to it. To bring it to the same potential as the, hel as the bring the helicopter to the same potential as the high tension wire so it won't arc over. What chance is that? Who drops the ground? The electrician or the helicopter? <laughs> I'm not, you can Google it. Yeah, the electrician does. I would say hypothetically it would be the technician. Yeah, it's the electrician that drops the rod. It's actually a 12 foot rod that he touches to the wire first. So, out of the but I want to go if, excuse me, if, if no one has a light bulb plugged into that high tension wire, is there any load on it? No. If there's no load, is there any amp flow? No. Do you still have to use that grounding rod so you don't die? Yes. Yeah, most definitely. Because the frequency of the generator, let's just say six, 60 hertz for sake of saying 60 hertz. The frequency also adds into the dielectric breakdown. At certain frequency, the voltage actually rides on the outside of the wire and it just kind of hangs out there. If the dielectric breaks down, you get a dead short, something happens. Once you have a dead short, then you have amperage flow. A dead short is low. Resistance is low. So,
took our place again and we put water in here. If we have a dead short, we just defeated our purpose. So we can't have a dielectric breakdown. We can't have a spark. We want to maintain that voltage potential on those plates. As long as you maintain the voltage potential with water in between, one side is positive, one side is negative, you make hydrogen. Understood? Pretty simple, right? Anybody have any questions about that? That's with no dielectric and a pulse? I mean, that's regardless no of the pulse. No electrolyte and a pulse? Whether you have any dielectric, any dielectric, you're going to create voltage. If we put water in there and we have a positive voltage on one side and a negative voltage on the other side, we're going to make hydrogen. Okay. If it short circuits, it blows up. <laughs> It dead shorts, it blows up. And there is at some point, there is a voltage potential that we want to reach. Right before dead shorts, that's the voltage potential we want. Well, when you're talking about a, 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 a water cell, and when you say blow up, you mean create bubbles? No, I mean blow up and you're dead. Your head falls off. Oh, jeez. Well, I've never seen a water cell do that. What, I, can you really? clarify that a little? They, out cell in cell California, really? out in California, some people were trying to compress hydrogen and oxygen, yeah. and it still had the two parts together, and it blew up, and it killed. The, if I remember right, the father lived, the son died, and a couple neighbors down the street were dead, and the top right. of the building was gone. It right. blew up. And some kids say, yeah, I, I'm sorry to hear that. The idea is the explosion is in the cylinder, in the, where the piston is. But everyone understands the basic concept of dielectric breakdown. There is a, some voltage potential that you can reach between the dielectric. Frequency, pressure, and temperature. Yeah. Also temperature. Again, you, you can research all that on uh, Tesla research with Tesla coils about dielectric breakdown between the wires and all that good stuff. Inductance and all that stuff. Tesla stuff, the research is wonderful. You, you might want to spell out that the reason that the hydrogen blew up is because oxygen was in You have to have, catalyst. in order to have an explosion, you need a, an accelerant to burn the fuel. Yeah. With no accelerant, there's no explosion. So if they were compressing hydrogen alone, they'd been okay. But the problem is, is with the, the with the electrolysis we're producing, we're splitting yeah. it. We got you, the oxygen in there, so you can't. We don't want to compress it. I can go down to the little oxygen, and I can buy a tank of hydrogen, 3,000 psi, 146 <laughs> cubic feet of hydrogen, 20 bucks. It's in a steel bottle. If I shoot that thing with a rifle. Put a hole in it. It'll just, if it does happen to ignite, which it won't, if it does ignite, it'll just blow a big flame. You put oxygen in that bottle, and you're not only dead, but your grandfather's dead, and he's already in the ground. You just made a great big mushroom cloud with a hole in it. So, hydrogen's perfectly storable perfectly injectable with the oxygen as long as you only use a small amount while you're injecting it. Yes, sir. Gary Hendershot, Scarecrow, pressurized HHO to 90 pounds. After that, he was scared. That's because his brain was too small to be scared to in a two pound. In a stainless steel can. <laughs> That was quite a lot of pressure. The cell, the cell behind you, I pressurized it at 15 PSI. It's stupid. I am stupid for doing But it's the only way to make a torch without being on demand. That's why I'm not going to light it in the building. That's why I don't sell hydrogen torches. If you have the gas mixed under pressure, someone will die. It's just a fact. Someone will die. And I hope it's not me. I just wanted to throw that out there. That I think you very much. It. I'm sure the, it's unstable. The Hindenburg. It's an unstable fuel. 
don't know. It, it stays and it's stays. It's plenty. Right? It's plenty it's stable. Water. The problem is is electrical potential. If you have electrical potential of your tank is one thing, and you have electrical potential on the ground, it creates a spark in the tank. Once you have a spark in the tank, everybody's dead. Game over. It wasn't worth it. So, anyone that is trying to store gas under pressure, you need an adequate facilities that can measure how much oxygen is in the mixture. If you don't have adequate equipment to measure oxygen with your hydrogen, don't play with it. It's a mistake, you're dead. You will die. So, where was I at here? It's 600 volt dielectric. If my dielectric constant is 600 volts, dielectric breakdown, what's the word again? Dielectric breakdown? Yeah, dielectric breakdown. The electric breakdown is 600 volts. For some reason, I want 10,000 volts. Where is it going to break down? At what point? 600. At the it's going to probably break down around 600 volts. At the right? Length. If that's the dielectric. Right. I'll never reach 10,000 volts, will I? Right. How can I reach 10,000 volts if my breakdown is 600? There is a way. How can I do it? Get a better dielectric. <laughs> Everything's the same, and I want to push 10,000 volts across the 600 volt dielectric. Capacity. If I make AC, will it ever charge? If, no, it won't, but pulse it with DC. But if I put an AC wave across there, will I ever get a positive negative potential? Well, yeah, both, but it, it, will, it will go to zero, really. It won't do anything, will yeah. it? Remember that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Our end goal is to charge one blade positive and let Mother Nature fill the negative. What do you think of that? Sounds like it takes a lot of work off our backs. Everyone wants free energy from the ether. If you want free energy from the ether, you have to open the door. If you make a positive potential, Mother Nature will give you Sign a negative me up. potential. Sign me up, man. <laughs> Is that understood? Yes. Yeah. Is there any way to create a positive only pulse? Yeah. How? Like an uh, automotive relay or SSR, silicon control relay. That doesn't or, uh, I don't know. Uh, take a, well, a one screwdriver to, cross to over battery the battery That's one way to do it. I guess maybe the other answer is what? Uh, Switching diode? So if we have a negative line here, if we have a zero line on our oscilloscope, okay, and we have something on our oscilloscope above this line, is it negative? No. It's a positive. The oscilloscope tells us it's positive, right? If we have a line down here, it tells us we're negative, right? If we have a line here, what do we have? Some kind of AC wave. We have a negative swing, we have a positive swing, right? So if we have a wave that looks like this, what do we have? AC. Do we? Is that, well, I, it's going below the, the, the line, actually. So we have a partial <laughs> negative and a partial positive, Technic right? Technically, yeah, okay. Technically, still an AC wave. Yeah. If Maybe you, one volt on the bottom, 10 volts on the top. Yeah. Is there a positive potential and a negative potential? Absolutely. Not really. I would say nine volts, positive. We have a biased wave. Okay. Simply Google biased waveform and you'll find a lot better explanation than I'll give in. If you have a biased wave, you still have an AC waveform. Max, is it the reason that Stan Meyer calls it a unipolar pulse is because he never goes below arbitrary ground? Once you get an arbitrary ground, you have, I have, the question you is have a short circuit. 
But I'm just saying, I'm trying to figure out why Stan never said positive pulses. And I, I just think it just some sort of dawned on me is he used the word unipolar, and I'm just saying if, if I'm getting to that, Ed. Will you give me a chance? Okay. Thank you, Ed. Can you make electrolysis with an AC wave? With AC power? If you have a zero reference, the zero reference is a ground reference. In my opinion, you will never make hydrogen with an AC wave. Correct. Now, can I finish? <coughs> can I smoke in here? No. <laughs> then go ahead. I'll give you a break here momentarily to take a smoke. Thank you. Bear with me. I know you're I'm boring into tears. I'm trying to stay away. That's all right. I saw you sleep. But I no, you did I not. forgive you. You did not. Farmer. I was looking down at my notes. <laughs> I'm going to give David a chance to excite everybody. I got on camera tonight, David? Yes, sir. Okay. I want you to continue on your path, and I want you to... I'm very, going to be brief, actually. No, very, very clear about this certain subject so that we can talk about this, because yeah. it's extremely that's, important. That's the point. And uh, everyone is watching live stream. AC does not make hydrogen. Wow. Correct. Now... Zero on the oscilloscope. Let's just call it ground. If you go below ground, you're shorting out your shit. Make sense? If you short it out, you ain't doing what you need to do. Okay. Now, referring to what David was getting to. If this is zero volts and this is one volt, right here is one volt and this is 10 volts, do I have a ground state? No, there is no ground. There is no Faraday electrolysis. Is that, I have, is that what they call floating ground? No, sir. Floating ground is where you didn't do your measurement accurately. Floating ground, I don't even want to go there. It's not worth the time. Miller, Miller effect. <laughs> if you take your VIC and you measure from a floating ground and you broadcast it all over the internet that you're measuring from a floating ground with the probe hanging in the air, you're an idiot. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you're on the internet and you have an AC waveform that passes zero reference ground, you're an idiot. So, if we have one volt here and ten volts here, that means there is one volt distance here. Correct? We are one volt above ground. This is a biased waveform. How do you bias a waveform? You gotta buy the circuits. He is exactly right. Get it? Bias? Buy? Buy us? If you want a biased waveform, you have to make it do what you want. I'm gonna let you look it up. Because there is many different ways to do it. Basically, your circuit tells that way that you want to bias it off of your zero ground. Now, I, Max Miller, I can choose any bias that I want. I can change that to 10 volts at the bottom peak. I can change that to 600 volts if I want. A bias of 600 volts. You now have a wave that looks like an AC wave, but it's a biased AC wave. Does that make sense? You have just biased above zero ground. But you need to make it a little clearer is, is that you're writing on, let's say you bias it at five volts. You have a producing a five volts of DC. Your signal is writing on top of that five volt DC signal. That's a five volt bias. You didn't assign a number yes. to it. That's more in depth. I'm not going to go into really in depth because the internet is really a great tool. 
But I was just biased the way you said that. I'm just trying to get everyone started to where you can look it up. If you guys are interested, maybe we'll do this again in six months and everyone can bring stuff that they're working on and you can share it amongst yourselves at one particular location with help. That would be something that everyone would have to ask for if you wanted to do something like that. To do this again in six months or a year. So, once you get above the ground state, you will make hydrogen. If you have a DC, which I think Ed was referring to, basically DC help me out here, Ed, it's a line and dashes. Well, yeah, some dashes is good to represent that it's, it's basically solid. this is negative and this is positive. This is basically representing uh, a battery in a in a block diagram. This is representation of DC current. DC is just you have on your oscilloscope, you're going to see just the line at whatever voltage. Okay? So the AC waveform would be 50 50, uh, and, unless you push it up one or the, one way or the other way, then it would be biased. Is that what you, you can make the waveform anything you want. Okay. You can bias any waveform off of zero reference current. Right, no DC. No. If you want DC, Unless you, want it. you can make hydrogen with DC, which is a voltage potential. Once you have a voltage potential, you can make any waveform you want above it. There is no magic waveform that will make hydrogen above another hydrogen. Until the secret is found. Okay. When you have an eruption in front of your face, oh. congratulations. So, any waveform, you have to bias it above the negative. The oscilloscopes are tricky though. Let's say you have the zero again. And you have a waveform that looks like this. This is your zero reference, your zero ground, if you will. And the oscilloscope shows one droop down and then a stair step coming up. Someone explain that to me. It's like it's almost like a step charge. It's a ramp charge, a, a step charge. charge. What about this first one? Now the guy on the internet, we learned something that day. He gave you a thing that the capacitance in the probe momentarily shot it to negative. That was a very good answer. That's a negatory. We learned something today, huh? That's a negatory. Is there a coil? The capacitance in the probe? The capacitance of, of the probe is not causing this effect. Is there a coil involved? Or yes. Okay, there, there is a Stanmire resonant coil involved. Okay, then it's the back EMF. No. Uh, okay. So, my big question to you, and I'm not going to answer it. I have a multitude of videos on YouTube. There are dozens and dozens of videos showing this exact waveform. If you answer this, then you understand what I understand. Negative resistance? I'm not going to answer it today. Okay. <laughs> What's the word, David? Intellectual property. Today is a Sunday. We're supposed to be nice. You're not, you're not open source. <laughs> <laughs> is right. it for That's proprietary right. information? Right. Is that same as for unlawful carnal knowledge of freedom? This is the same as saying people that help me get answers. Everyone here today, I'm very glad that you come here. And if you can answer this question, you're going to understand a huge amount. I 
can make a full biased waveform with a ramping wave above the zero on the oscilloscope. But I can do that. I have videos showing that. You don't see them. There are plenty of videos showing this. If you understand what this is, and I already did give you the answer a little few minutes ago. If you understand what is happening here, you will understand how to do it. Do you want that or are you trying to eliminate I demonstrate this so everyone will look at it and we'll try to figure out why I show. It's a non one But I show it because it makes bubbles and it shows the ranking wave but it also shows a, a very, very good oscilloscope that clearly shows one pulse, one or two pulses, mainly one pulse that goes past the ground point of the oscilloscope. If you understand that, you're going to understand all of it. Does that make sense? There's no reason for me to tell you how to go fishing if you're never going to go fishing. If you go fishing, you're going to catch a fish. You will educate yourself. And that is called as a ramping charge. Stan Myers wants a unipolar ramping charge. If you can make a ramping charge, yes, Frank. Sorry, got to work the theory here. Um, is it possibly nature building up its uh, negative charge and? He's on the right track. A very good right track. Not quite the correct answer, but it's a very good right, right track. Because you said at the beginning, if you provide the negative, nature will give you the positive. What, what did Chanson just say? Oh, if, you, if you give it the negative, nature will provide the other half. That's what happens in a storm? So, I just said I'm not going to answer it. No, David. No, David. No, David. No, David. No, David. No, David. No, this is not so, an answer. This is a place to look. All right, fair enough. I wouldn't do that to you. Fair enough. I'll beat you up later. Hold on. Get the microphone. Fair enough. So, another another place to look for this um, mysterious dipping charge is an oscilloscope for the automotive um, parade pattern where you're watching for uh, spark ignition. It's another place to look for. It's not going to tell you what it is, but it's another place you can see it. A very clean place you can see it. The internet is your college. I've just explained to you how to find the potential and how to bias. Rough idea of biasing the potential above the negative, and you don't want it to explode. As you make hydrogen, as long as the as long as the pulse is above grounding. You make hydrogen, okay? As you're making hydrogen, at some point this wave will level off. If the wave levels off, you're not making hydrogen. You're still making hydrogen, but you've reached the peak voltage potential of your cell. Myers said that once it dropped down, it still maintained the voltage for like Yes, sir, I believe you're correct. We're not going to get quite into that. Oh, uh, one, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Yes, David. I'm doing my best to think here. Right. Go ahead, buddy. Okay, so amperage, voltage normally trails amperage. Voltage and amperage is not the same thing. You can, in fact, have voltage without amperage. You cannot have amperage without voltage first. If you take a light switch and turn on a light switch, there's a blue flash when you turn it on. Amperage is fat, I'm sorry. Voltage moves at whatever speed it moves at. David can go into speeds if he wants to. Voltage is fast, very, very fast. Speed of light, I don't know. Could be faster than light. Voltage moves very fast. Amperage travels at the speed of ions through of that material. 
Uh, copper ions move at the speed that copper ions move through water, amperage speed. How they measure amperage is they measure the resistance between two distances, the voltage across that distance, then they know the amperage. Your amperage needle moves. So if you study how voltage moves and how amperage moves, and if you understand this, I give you all of the answers to that. There is no magic frequency to make water explode. It's bullshit. <laughs> resonance. It's true. Resonance is a, a very bad word, in fact. There's multiple meanings to resonance. Stan Myers wanted electrical resonance. Once you achieve electrical resonance, if you turn it off, it's going to keep working after you turn it off until that resonance ends. You can look up all kinds of reson electrical resonance, generally between a capacitor and an inductor, at some frequency you get resonance. All the stand circuits, they were designed approximately five kilohertz. Five kilohertz is not the resonant frequency of water. Resonant, I'm gonna tell you another secret and I'm gonna tell you it's a secret. Water resonance is in the gigahertz. Am I right, David? Gigahertz. And potentially higher, depending on the Yes. The resonance of water is in the gigahertz, and Stan only went around 5 kilohertz. 2.4 gigahertz. 2.4 giga gigahertz, good enough for me. Stan only went around 5 kilohertz. There's no way 5 kilohertz will explode water when water is 2.5 gigahertz. You understand that? Yes. Microwave is an AC wave into the gigahertz, it heats water. Right. Because it's a resonant frequency of water. Right. Is every microwave the same frequency? Approximately. No. It's quite a broad band width, actually. Around 2.4 on average. Around. Yeah. Gigahertz is pretty fucking fast. You can go up or down that scale all you want, and you're still pretty close to 2.5 gigahertz. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's all about electromagnetic spectrums and inductance, capacitance. I'm not going to go into inductance and capacitance, LC circuits. You can easily find that. All you have to do is look up AM radio circuits. You'll find all the tank circuits that you want. If you take a radio in your car, you probably don't remember. I used to have a dial. You turn that dial and you could tune into your radio station. When you turn that dial, you had an inductor and a capacitor, and when the resonance matched your radio station, you picked up the broadcast. In reality, there's a thousand different broadcasts going in the air. You tune in the resonance of that station, you listen to the music. So all of your new radios, they have a phase lock loop inside the radio. You hit scan and the, it searches for that station. Electronic search for that station. Phase lock loop is nothing new. Scanning and searching for resonant frequencies, nothing new. The frequency, magic frequency of water is not 5 kilohertz. Everything I have done says Stan told the truth and his circuits will resonate around 5 kilohertz. I can change that to 10 kilohertz if I want. I can change it to 20 kilohertz. I still, I can change that to 40 kilohertz. In fact, I can change that to 500 kilohertz. I still get the same response on the water. It's not the magic frequency of the water. And I will tell you there's a lot more into it, but you have to understand the basics. If you look into the alternator, or you look into the 8XA, those are the basic circuits. And I will eventually prove they do resonate. I will do it. I have actually, never mind. 
you will find that Stan told the truth and everyone here today, you, you were talking, we had plenty of people talking about Stan. We have people that know what Stan did, but they don't know they know. I have an automotive coil. How fast does an automotive coil resonate? As fast as you want. I have a lot of older videos that show a lot. I play with car coils. If you take a car coil and you have a spark that jumps across two electrodes, basically you have a capacitor at those points. It's just two wires, but it's still capacitor, right? So you take that car coil, it's already designed for the primary and the secondary to resonate. Someone already did that work for you. You take and pulsate that car coil. When you get the maximum arc length, that's your maximum voltage. That's your resonant frequency of the car coil. So if you just take a square wave and you're farting around with the car coil, you can find the resonant frequency of the car coil and your spark might jump that much. Okay? Now I'm gonna tell you, you take that same car coil and you add a gate. I'm assuming, going on the assumption most of you know what a gate is. So this is a frequency wave, it's just a square wave frequency. If I remove part of this, this is now called a gate. It's just a mixing section, miss, missing section. I can make, I can gate this, the, this missing section could be anything. This is what's known as a pole string. I can, with, I can widen this anything I want. I can make these any width I want. I can make this any width I want. If I play around with that, using this gate, I can take a car coil. With, without the gate, the car coil probably resonates around 500 hertz. That's pretty slow. If I add the gate, I can change the resonant frequency of that car coil to 500 kilohertz. If I have no gates, I let's just pull out 50 hertz, 50 hz, 50 hertz to resonate a car coil. If I add the gate and play around with these, I can change that to 500 kilohertz resonant frequency with a step charge coming off of it. What happens, can you make the gate shorter than the off time? Yes. Can I help you do a drawing? Say again? Can yes. I use the chalkboard with you? Actually, you can take over here moment. No, down. I just want to do one thing really quick. Jump on up. I have a theory. Jump on up. This is my friend. Jump on up. <laughs> the hillbilly. Come on now! Come on now! Come on now. <laughs> Excuse me. My point is, if you want to study resonant frequency of a transformer, buy a, a car coil. Go to the junkyard, pitch his inch, you can probably pick up all you want. Put a three amp fuse on a car coil, because if you pull more than three amps, you will melt the car coil and you can put more than three amps into a car coil. Also, the, the point is, stand specified around five kilohertz. If you adjust the gap in your core of the car coil or any other coil, you can change the permeability of the core, which you can change the resonant frequency of the transformer. You take the gate, 
and you use the gate, you can change the frequency, the resonant frequency. What you're doing is charging the core of the coil. So can you arrange the gates in an array? Gate array. As in mobile gates? Mobile signals? Well, an array is planned. Yeah, it, electronically it's not a problem. You have multi-phase arrays with, you can make all kinds of harmonics out of the circuit that's staying you. Okay. The, the harmonics are unlimited. Thank you. That's the main problem with figuring out what he did because there's a multitude of happenings that show up on the scope. Standing waves, reflective waves, sub-harmonics, harmonics, they're all there. So a gate array circuit might enable you to decide this okay, you, you would have to define it a little bit more, draw a picture or something. I'm sorry, Dave. Okay. I have never built, I've never, I've never built your Scanmire circuit. It's just, just a theory. So you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Maybe. Maybe. So you just told me that the gating can be made faster than the off time. So th if this if this is the uh, this is representation of the off time, and let's just say this is ten milliseconds of off time. Okay. Ten milliseconds of off time. But this is the on time. Yes. And so this is ten milliseconds of on time. That's the same. Okay? Same. 50% of the duty cycle of your game. Right. Now, no. Go ahead. Separate Go ahead. duty cycle and gating. 50% of the duty cycle is 50% on, 50% off, 50% on, 50% off. Duty cycle. Duty cycle circuit. Now you're talking about gating. So now you have another duty cycle imposed on top of gating, in, or on top of another duty cycle and call that gating. So if you made this gating two milliseconds, two milliseconds, and two milliseconds. What happened to the 10 milliseconds? Just hold on. So you have two milliseconds of gated time, but your ramping energy is here. Before you get to capacitance of your cell, you turn it off. Yes. Now it's off. Now you turn it immediately back on. Yes. Now you're gonna have, you're gonna capture the back EMF and you're gonna go up again, and you're gonna turn it off before your dielectric constant, your capacitance of your cell, and then you're gonna turn it off. Every time you capture the back EMF, you're gonna grow this step. Right, and then you're gonna come up again, and you're gonna go again. You're gonna end up with a ramping wave up. So right, and then you're gonna do it again, and again, until you come to Let's do this a little bit more accurately. There's only one problem. Hold on, I ain't done yet. I'll let you finish. Thank you. Because this is just a theory. I don't care if I'm right or wrong. Because I've got, I got shit to do with what I'm doing. I'm just helping you out. I want you. I'd like to thank David Pupta again for coming all the way from California. Thank you guys, I appreciate that. He, he could have just as easily took the $2,000 plane ticket and bought tacos for like a month. Oh, right. Okay. Soy burger. A couple days for me. So, let's raise this and get it exaggerated. Okay. So, like Max talked about earlier, the dielectric of the cell, you don't want to break that down because you don't want a dead short between the two because this is a little bit more importantly what happens. Cell one, cell two, doesn't matter positive, negative. You got 
ions and ions. Okay? When these ions, when they exchange, this one goes here, this one goes here, faster than the speed of light, the atoms start to form when the electrons regain their their cloud, regain their potential, right? Still a positive ion and a negative ion because we're talking about water, which is hydrogen and oxygen. He's actually causing the, the plate would be positive, that is the negative ion. Okay. Right. So, so the positive and negatives attract, all that stuff. But you don't want there to be a bubble chain between the two. An ionic, but right before the atoms formed, the ion looks like this. Okay, it looks like a piece of cotton, you know, a little fluffy piece of cotton. And you don't want those little cottons to intertangle with each other. Because when they do, they make a perfect chain and break the dielectric constant before the atom, before the bubble is formed. Once the bubble is formed, there's no more ion. If there's no more ion, you're not going to get a discharge. You need to complete the circuit and have all the electrons donated to their proper atom, whether it be hydrogen and, and oxygen. Now this, we're going to talk about hydrogen and oxygen, but this happens in all chemical um, electrolysis, whether you're doing it in acids or whatever you're doing. So, but you want the bubble to form back to a bubble or back to an atom before that happens. And this particular dielectric charge that is faster than the speed of light and technically invisible for this conversation of theory. Now you have a bubble. You want to stop your gating and your ramping effect of catching the EMF before the bubble happens, okay? So there, there's your gating in between the off time, which is your, um, your off time, your, your duty cycle. And then you start the process back over again. Why would you start the process back over again instead of just keeping the process? Well, it's obvious. You need the cell to relax. Here's what Max is not telling Here's what Max is not telling you. Here's where Stan Meyer proved over-efficient electrolysis. Now you've got this pent-up energy. Where is this pent-up energy going to go? It's going to go in the capacitance of the circuit. What is the circuit? Now this is something I want you guys to really, really understand. Stan Myers told you all the secrets. He told you everything. But he told you to tell to learn it for yourself in the build. There is no book that tells you how Stan did. But I'm going to tell you that that is absolutely 150 percent correct, and I'm going to explain to you right now why this is correct. It's right in front of your face but you don't even know it. Is your, tube, is your tube cell on wheels? Is that, is that table on wheels? All right. So this is Stan Meyer's tube cell. Okay? I'm only going to draw one. I'm only going to draw one electrolytic cell. Okay? I'm pretty fucking strong, and I ate my lunch all day long, and when I first met Max, I realized he's bigger than I am, and I'm gonna have to bring my lunch, but I have to kick his ass. So luckily we like each other, but after I'm done here, if he gets pissed off, it's not my problem. <laughs> Here's Stan Meyer's tube cell. 
What did Stan Meyer do specifically for you guys? He used the outside tube, and we're just gonna, I don't know the exact dimensions, but we're just gonna do dimensions here. The outside tube is, let's say, 100 thousandths thickness in the wall. But the outside tube is bigger than the inside tube. What is the outside tube? The outside tube is um, one inch. It's one inch in diameter in my drawing. So we got a hundred thousandths wall thickness in one inch, right? Now we have the inside tube that also has a one hundred thousandths wall clearance, okay? But it's three quarters of an inch. Doesn't make sense yet. Shit, this doesn't make sense to my theory. <laughs> Let's prove that even further. Now we're going to come down here to Stan Meyer's demonstration cell. He floats the positive electrode tube and he anchors the negative electrode tube so he has a real solid base for the, ele for the negative electrode tube, right? Shit, this still doesn't make any sense. Let's make sure this makes complete sense. Step number one. Now bear in mind. Step number one. Bear in mind this is not my value. Step number one. A whole different person. From this tube on the negative to this tube on the positive, the negative tube is smaller than the positive two. Hmm. That's an unbiased circuit in capacitance talk. That doesn't make sense because we want a positive capacitance. How does that make sense? It makes sense like this. It takes longer for the electrons to go around the positive two than it does the negative tube because electricity goes around the outside of the tube, right? So the capacitance of electrons on the positive side are, are much greater than the capacitance on the negative side, right? Because you can fit more electrons on the positive tube because it's got a bigger circumference. Shit, that still doesn't make any correct confirmation. How do we offset this? Now, we have a huge negative base. So, but we don't have any electrolytic reaction really going on here because we need a, we need an equal positive and a negative, ne we need a, we need them to be equal so they meet in the middle. Not very many bubbles happen down here. But the negative side of this circuit has more capacitance to hold the charge, not the electronic charge of the electro of the earth charge or the monatomic charge or the back side of the hydrogen charge, which we will talk about next. And I will show you clearly on a oscilloscope what we're talking about. We're talking about Mother Nature's charge here. We're talking about the charge that comes up from the ground to catch the lightning to split the dielectric so lightning can hit the earth. What do you call that, ether energy? We call that ether energy, or we're gonna call those scalar waves, or we're gonna slow them down and call them linear magnetism. Do you know what I call it? God. But we're gonna call it electric, dia we're gonna call it dielectric capacitance all the dielectric capacitance to offset this circuit is stored here in the negative, in the mass of Stan Meyer's demonstration cell. The frequency differential between the circuit, high frequency ionosphere on the positive tube, low frequency on the negative tube because the, the speed 
of the electrons and the capacity of the electrons is greater on the bigger two. Remember we talked earlier about electrons versus hertz. I want you to keep thinking that hertz is a volt. One hertz, one volt. Multiple volts can be stored in the positive tube. Okay? Raises the frequency of the positive tube, lowers the frequency of the negative tube. Discharge effect happens. Max told you, it goes to ground. Where does it go? Get protection. Not in the fuse. We proved that yesterday. It doesn't happen in the fuse. It sits in the cell. Look at Big Bertha. Look at all Stan Meyer's shit. Look at Sparky over here with the spark plug. Where is ground? The engine block. Where is positive? The electrode. The electrode's high frequency. Ground, when everything shuts off, it dissipates into the ground so that the power doesn't keep, so it doesn't stay. But what does that do for you? No. The ground state, quiet. The ground state transforming that energy brings forward the linear magnetism that you saw last night in private for the cold fusion brings forward the other state of matter. That capacitance builds up when this, cir when this circuit is off, the bubbles are still being made. The bubbles didn't stop being made. Once that charge is infused, the e we're gonna call it the ether, so you guys can all get on the same definition. The ether is infused into the negative dielectric it gets released, and when it gets released, it gets transformed back into electromagnetism. If you understand the ether being the energy that fills a magnet, we swipe a magnet across the magnet, uh, across the piece of copper, and it transforms it into electromagnetism that we enjoy today. The energy is stored in here, and then it gets transformed back out and keeps making bubbles. So what Stan proved to you is that he's not charging the, the, uh, the hydrogen here. He's charging the ether. He wants to continue to catch these EMF spikes so it becomes impossible for it to escape. And then he turns it off. And it's got no place to go because it technically doesn't have enough electromagnetism to, to break the column bond and break the bubble at that point. Once saturation is made, okay, it's saturation, then it gets released and turns into electromagnetism during the 50% gated off time. Not here. This is linear magnetism, unavailable yet. Once it transforms and comes out of the metal during this off time, it makes electricity, okay? You know this to be true because of the dielectric constant. When you turn off a cell, how many seconds does it make bubbles? It depends on the resonance you achieve. It Two or three be, seconds. It could be a minute. Okay. We're talking a minute. Right. We're talking an off time and an on time of milliseconds. Charging the electric. How do we know, wait, how do we know that this is what Stan Meyer was achieving? We had an eyewitness that witnessed the EPG. What did that do? The EPG turned on light bulbs one light bulb, and then the next light bulb, and then the next light bulb, and then the next light bulb, okay? When you turn on your electric switch over there, all your freaking light bulbs come on at one time. Why is that? Because your switch is releasing the electromagnetism. It's closing the circuit, and here comes your electromagnetism, game on. The EPG building up the ether energy 
turning on the light bulb, once that first light bulb gets in saturation, electromagnetism shows itself. Now it's in saturation. The next light bulb comes on, it becomes saturation, and the third light bulb comes on. That's all he's doing right here, okay? But he's still perfected, built circuits, understood, and applied the linear magneto effect. This is why Stan Meyer got his patents, because he didn't defy the laws of physics, he applied the laws of physics. Yes. Thank you. This is why I support Max Miller 100%. And anybody ever says that Stan Meyer's a fraud, simply it's for uncaught. Fuck you. Even though it's Sunday, we're supposed to be nice. Agreed. That's the bottom line. Agreed. He never got past the laws of physics because you cannot get past the laws of physics. Physics are physics, they're real. Now, what Stan Meyer did not go into is he didn't get past the conservation of energy. He did not go into quantum electronics. He didn't go into quantum theory. He applied the linear magneto effect. That's all he did. And stay within the boundaries of physics. How he did it is really not important because now you can buy circuits from Max and apply it yourself. Did I explain that well enough for you? Thank you, Max. Thank you, David. Now, in truth, when I said I wasn't going to tell you, even though David told you, maybe it just spun your brain. This isn't all of it. This Absolutely is just, not. Just the beginning. Now, if you go to my forum, which is free, and you go to the thread that's marked resonance, how many of you were children once? Everybody. Did you have a coloring book when you were a child? Maybe you colored on the walls or you played with dirt. All I had when, it, when I was a kid was dirt. If you get on my forum under the resonance thread, it's one, it's its own thread, and I actually made it so it's like eight pages long without anyone jibber jabbering bullshit on the thread, and then I implanted it into the forum where people could talk, and then it got disgraced by some worthless pieces of shit. If you read the first pages, it will give you a coloring book of exactly how to do it. Nice. It is a coloring book with visual oscilloscope pictures with waveforms, hand drawn in paint, step charts, unipolar pulse drains, why it does it, when it does it, in picture form. All you have to do is look at it. If you want to copy it, that's all you. But I encourage people to join in on that particular thread. I maintain a forum at, it's not even my cost actually, a friend of mine pays for it. He does the whole forum he pays for. The sole purpose for that forum is for you. I know what it does. I don't need to read it. You need to study it. It is for free on the forum. It's free. The forum is maintained so you can read it. David and I both just give you some instructionals, although I would like to add something before we saw to your instructional. It was just a theory. A very, uh, a pretty good one, actually. I got a question. 
Yes, Mr. Jansen. Uh, for more than two years, you've been in possession of $120,000. For yes, two sir. years, I've asked you to go ahead and for two, you said Stanley Meyer told the truth. Yes, sir. And I'm busting my ass. I got 10 of these channels going, uh, I mean, up in 10 of these. Uh, you want the microphone, Mr. Chancellor? Made here. Microphone, Mr. Chancellor. And I, I'm asking you, you say he's told the truth, but you're not building the 10 channels. I'm winding up doing it. I gave the money, and I wind up doing it. I think this would get it over with. Mr. We got Chancellor. the theory. They Mr. got the theory. Mr. Let's Chancellor. just go ahead and do it and move on. Mr. You Chancellor. Talk theory all day long. Let's go ahead and do it. Mr. Chanson said, let's put it together. <laughs> Sounds it's, like me. It's ready to assemble. Ed, it's ready to assemble. The forum has been set so up. Next, next month, we're going to have another meeting here and show that we going, okay? I hope so. Actually, we're. I mean, got actually, the, Ed, Mr. Ed, got the water fuel Mr. Ed, Mr. Yeah. Ed, we're making someone wait that wishes to progress things. They are okay. waiting on the phone. Okay. <coughs> oh, we're almost such. I love. I'm going to jump in here really quick. I love the fact that Ed's got freaking ants in his pants and a fucking bucket of cash to put forward to this. Hey, you know what else Ed's got? Ed Chanson has the balls to put the money up and bitch me out for the world to see it. Right. So, but there's something that's missing. Right? There's a, there's a piece of the puzzle that's missing. And the piece of the puzzle that's missing has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with technology. It has nothing to do with ability. It has to do with understanding. Because is I don't know if I can even get a nod here. Does any I don't I can't prove that the buggy ever ran. I can't prove that the buggy runs. All I can tell you is when you listen to the video, I'm an engine builder. When you listen to the video of Stan Meyer taking off, all I had to hear the exhaust to say that it did run. Not the fact that the tone of the, the exhaust made noise, the pitch and the tone of the exhaust. And I'm gonna be very clear here. I've spent 30 years of my life building engines from nitromethane drag race motors professionally to Porsche to Mercedes. And my job is to hear the exhaust to tell you what that engine is doing on the inside. Spec to the fuel. I have a hard time disbelieving that that was not a hydrogen thump. I have a very hard time disbelieving that. I believe that that was a hydrogen thump when Stan Meyer took off. That's an interesting Can we agree that action speaks louder than words? Ed wants to make it work. I'm ready to make it work. There's people waiting to talk to me on the phone to make Amen. it work. Amen. All right. Right now. They're waiting for me right now. Right now. Yep. This very minute. Ten minutes ago. So, the forum, the forum is there for you, not me. I agree. I don't need to be here. I could give a shit less if my face is on that TV. You wanted to see a face. Here's my face. I'm not pretty. <laughs> I'm going to second that. The forum is there for you. Use it. If you don't use it, it's your fault. 98% of the answers is on that resonance thread on that forum. I put it there for the world. Ed paid to put it there. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Everything on the forum is there because of Ed. All of the answers are there. Approximately all of the answers. IronDmax.com will link you to the forum. Just type Google IronDmax forum. And honestly, I got to be really busy. I do have shit to assemble. 
but the information is already there. The residence thread is a really good starting point after you understand what David and I just told you. David, in my opinion, has made one mistake on this description. David, can I have your assistance, please? Here in two minutes. Can I, have, can I have your assistance over here? Of course. Here, erase that for me. <laughs> Come on, that was fine. So this is how we get rid of... I hope everybody had a good time. I hope everybody listening had a good time. I'm sure there's going to be people going over the video. I hope everybody has a good time, has a good laugh. And again, I appreciate David. I appreciate... Ed, I appreciate everybody in this room. So that's how we get rid of uh, now, stuff. Back EMF. Standing Meyer circuit, back EMF. I have one answer for that. You're nuts. My nuts are bigger than Russ's. <laughs> <laughs> I have a video to prove that my nuts are going to be nice. They ain't a big man. I actually lost it. Got a honeycomb? <laughs> nuts! <laughs> you fucking draw like shit. <laughs> you know? You know? Ross, the boy, the man, the young man in the hat. In fact, I rather like Russ. Russ is pretty cool, actually. I rather like the man. Yeah, he is. Russ is nuts. Yeah, he is. He's pretty crazy. A few, has it been a month? At least a month. A month ago, Russ made a video <laughs> talking about his nuts. If you watch Russ's video of I Russ's nuts. <laughs> Do you think Russ was playing with his nuts during some cycle when he had more time to play with his nuts? Do you think there was like some lunar cycle or that during that month that he has more time to play with his nuts than any other time? Do you think there's a lunar cycle available? Or is there a different cycle? The reason I bring up Russ's nuts specifically, which David actually reproduced bigger nuts. I have bigger nuts. So, Ed Leeds Leet Skelton. Skelton. Any way you want to pronounce it. It was based on Ed's experiment. Well, what's that thing called? Coral Castle. The, the the device. What's the device called? The professional motion holder. What holds Russ's nuts together? Voltage field. Linear voltage. Yes. Say that one more time. Linear voltage. Okay, I just want to make sure that you said that one more time. Linear voltage. What's worse than the tornado? <laughs> so, the way the thing functions, you put iron, any iron together, you snap it with a back EMF. That back EMF travels in a circle. It continuously, forever, travels in a circle in one direction <clears throat> until Russ's nuts are broken. The linear magnetism travels in one direction. I must say that Max has bigger nuts than mine now, but I actually heard him. Poor Russ, I don't know. That. Man. 
Now, if you look on the video of Russ's nuts, you will see read my comment and it will explain exactly this. Forever the energy will spin in one direction and one direction only. There is no reversal. When you have a reversal, the nuts will fall apart. Forever this thing will stay in its position because linear voltage magnetism is spinning in one direction. When you break the nuts, you break the cycle of the spinning. There is no back EMF until you break the nuts. When you break the nuts, you get a back EMF that will light an LED light. Until you break the connection, there is no back EMF and no voltage reversal. In Stan Myers' VIC, there is no back EMF. It is a pteroid. Linear magnetism in one direction in a pteroid. What do you think of that, Farmer? Still a fucking hell, Billy. Um, fair enough. Fair enough. So what happens in the little circuit, if you guys want to repeat it, is just to take a battery, positive and negative, dead short the battery, dead short the battery, um, make sure that you're smoking on top of the battery, <laughs> make sure you don't wear eye protection, in fact, put a tank top on. <laughs> and then when you do that, you put the nuts in the parade, you get them close together, <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as you touch the battery, the nuts clinch, right? The nuts clinch. And then, the battery, right? then all the metal pieces come together as well. When that happens, the linear magnetic field is induced. What that tells you is that two things. Linear magnetism is faster than electromagnetism. A linear magnetism is voltage-based. Yes. Stan Meyer bringing forward the linear magneto effect by pulsing a crystalline lattice definable in physics shows that linear magneto effect. This shows that linear magnetism comes before magnetism, voltage based. Then amperage is like a last voltage is like lightning. Amperage is like molasses in Alaska, in comparative. It's slow. The dielectric of lightning is over before amperage can even be measured. But what happens is, what we were talking about, is at 201 milliamp is when linear magnetism is overrun by electromagnetism. So, before the amperage comes to play, the nuts are clinched and you're done. You just tap the electrode and it comes on. He's right, this is a perpetual machine. Ed Lightskin, Russ, a long time ago, did the horseshoe magnet thing where you've got a magnet here and a magnet here and you charge the horseshoe and they stick together and you put an LED over here and you pull this apart you make electricity, big freaking deal. We do it on a generator every day. It's exactly what happens in a generator. As soon as you spin it, this circuit is, the nuts are clinched and taken apart multiple times. But one nut is magnet, one nut is iron in a generator. So you keep the electromagnetism being produced. Like you said, as soon as you take apart this circuit, you fire a light bulb. What's a light bulb? Electromagnetism, okay? That's the basic circuit. That's the basic understanding. Now, hopefully, you understand where Stan Myers was dealing and why it was definable in physics. Stan Myers, the IC coil, there is no backing MF. If you have backing MF and you're broadcasting, you figured it out. Congratulations, you just made AC wave across your oscilloscope. You will not get hydrogen from an AC wave. As soon as you dead short that, we proved it yesterday, the circuit pops a fuse, and where, where did the fuse blow? 
his tire didn't blow, his wires didn't blow, it went all the way back through the diode, through the bridge, the, through the bridge rectifier, which is supposed to stop electricity. That's true. That's fucking nice. Electronic circuit. You think a circuit board, populated circuit board, components on a board. That's the whole circuit, right? Wrong. No. If you touch the circuit, you get electrocuted, correct? You just become part of the circuit. The entire circuit is everything. Plates, inductors, wire, traces on the board. That is the entire circuit. Anything else? Yeah. And the water molecule is part of the circuit. Okay. Yes. So we're talking about electrolytic cells, and we're trying to give you the idea and the understanding to correctly replicate what is already known. Stan Meyer's patents are open source, you guys can go build them, whatever. It's based on standard commercialization with no IP. The IP is in the understanding. Max Miller has been gracious enough to do the understanding, bring it to layman's terms so you guys can understand it. Let's take that one step further. The next step is when you build an electrolytic cell, the first thing that you have to build is you have to build the cell. Because you don't know what the capacitance of the circuit is until you build the cell. After you build the cell, then you can build your circuit. No other way, just like an engine. You don't build an engine and then go down and find gasoline or alcohol. You build the engine for the fuel. If you're gonna run nitromethane, you pick your fuel first. You say, all right, I'm gonna run nitromethane. I'm gonna run um, whatever I want. Alcohol, benzene, propane, doesn't matter. You pick your energy carrier first. Then you tune your motor. You don't leave all your nuts and bolts out of the motor and you don't leave all your nuts and bolts out of the circuit. You make sure everything is tuned from start to finish. Tuning, simple, brief summary. This has been gone over from all of the great people that have gone over this, but we'll make it summarized. The cell has to resonate harmonically, mechanically, first. It's not necessary, but it's good practice. First thing that you do is you make the mechanical resonance so that you can understand the frequencies between the two. Once that harmonic resonance is made, just by getting your app off of your cell phone and going in and finding a frequency app for music, you take the cell, you hold it with a pe your metal, you hold it with something that's not going to vibrate like a zip tie or plastic or something, and you hit it with a dead blow hammer and you measure the frequency. Very simple. You write that number down, 1600. Now, you take the other one, you hit it, and you write that number down. Cut your tubes to length, make your plates to size so that they're close to magnetic resonance. Into, just like an organ pipe, just like, well, two things, a tuning fork is more important to understand. Once you get that done, you put that aside. Now you start building your, your cell. Then when it's all said and done and everything's bolted together, then you figure out your capacitance of the cell. How much does it weigh? How big is it? How much, how much is it gonna hold? Unfortunately, that mathematical calculation is proprietary to me, to Max, and to each person who builds their own cell. That's something for you to figure out on your own. Because I can't tell you how to do it. There's no way for me to tell you how to do it. You just have to understand and it'll just come to you. No. The next thing, after all those two things are done, and you build your circuit, yeah, actually I am done. Those are the two things that I wanted to point out. Now, as a circuit designer, I never went to college. So what? Look at shit. So, I design circuits. Very nice circuits. If anyone says not, they can kiss my ass. It's like an all-day job. Fair enough. So, when you design a circuit board, 
you make it function, make it do what it, you tell it to do what you want it to do. When you hook it up, maybe there's an anomaly. You find the anomaly, you fix it. Maybe you have to completely redesign your board. Reason being, capacitance is a strange thing. It's everywhere. Voltage potential is capacitance. I could build a circuit and there's so much voltage potential across the circuit itself, it fucks up the chips. I have to redesign the board. It's a lot of work. I'm pretty lazy. So, a circuit is everything connected to everything. You have to figure out every part of the circuit, and then you, and then you debug it. And if you go to my forum, Iron D Max forum, the thread that says resonance. If that doesn't answer your question, I can't help you. Yes, sir. Can you please re-explain the theory of those the iron nuts? Thank you very much. I was I should. So, if you go onto Google and you look up antique memory computer memory storage, you will find a million little pteroids all looped together in a box. That was the first computer memory storage. Each pteroid was either charged or not charged. Charged was an on, not charged was an off. It held in a pteroid the linear magnetism forever. There was pteroid upon pteroid that was the first computer memory. Study that and it will explain this exactly. And so to, to, to stack the bytes that we enjoy now. In the Each computer, byte was a pteroid. Each byte was a pteroid. So if they had them in a grid, they just pulled at the end of the grid and said, look, I want 10 of these bytes and four of these bytes at the same time. I want 10 positive and 10 negative. Over here, okay? And so what Max is correct, but not exactly correct. You can circle it this way, right? And as it's circling, it's making a very small charge, right? It's very small. So you put these ones in this way, and these ones in this way, or these ones in this way, and now you have your algebra, right? Mathematical chart, time chart, you know? So if you want this one and this one, it will be the sum of these, and that's your byte number. Very simple shit. Very simple stuff, and it's the basis of computers today. Same thing. But the most important point is, is Ed over here proved that the magnetism stays perpetual. So if anybody that's still alive in your grandfather's state says, well, perpetual motion is not true, then they don't have a computer because that's how computers work. Stores the memory forever. Until, right. until this is pulsed again with an electromagnetic pulse, and destroys the memory of the chip. I think they call it a magnetic diode. Maybe. No. No? Wrong. Wrong. What is it called? Look it up, please. Oh, okay. So, thank you. I forgot what I was going to say. Electromagnetic transformers. There is also electromagnetic amplifiers. What else was there? Electromagnetic amplifiers. You can spin the magnetism in any direction. You can add coils, add other coils. You can make this thing into anything that a transistor device will do. You can do it with linear magnetism in pteroids grouped together. What was the name of that book? Shit, I forgot. Uh, magnetic amplifiers by the United States. No, 
military some shit. No. It's totally cool. Some shit. Military some shit. Look it up. Google, I'm sure it'll come around up. Don't you have it on your phone? No. Um, Magnetic amplifiers of the military. Find it, Google it. It was made before transistors. Does anybody have a cell phone that's online right now that can use the internet right now? No. This is important. It is important. It's important for you guys to understand why we're here and why Max and I do what we do. And it's important enough that I just made someone wait that probably has like $3 million. Hopefully they call back. Is there a significance to the clockwise drawing of the earth? Not exactly, no. Almost done, Mr. Eddie. Did we miss the phone call? Um, no, but as soon as you're ready, I have something for you guys. You, too. you and David. Somewhere. Thank you very much, Eddie. And while, while I'm here, I'd very much like to say, at this point, if people don't get involved, you're an idiot. If you have money, you don't get involved, you're an idiot. There's people here today that can, may possibly get involved. People watching may possibly get involved. If you don't get involved, I don't know what to tell you. You have to help yourself. I'm an old man. I'm getting tired. And for anybody out there that wants to say I'm wrong, don't waste my time anymore because I'm not replying. Okay. We're going to capitalize on something that Stan Myers put right in front of your faces. You didn't even realize what the old man was saying, but we're going to make it, prove it to you right now.
I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And now we're going to digress into this. Stan Meyer made it very clear that the sound, that everything that he's doing, it can be found in music, right? ACDC right now, today, is the number one highest grossing band of all times. They're the biggest, they're the best, they're the most wealthy band on the planet. They were the first. They were the first to understand the linear magneto effect. This song was first played on the back of a flatbed with a piece of shit truck and a piece of shit alternator, running that energy into the amps of the guitars, filling the amps up with as much capacitance as they possibly could get it at that time to get the guitar to resonate. Anybody like Jimmy Hendry? Anybody like rock and roll? If you don't, then just mess on my problem. It's your problem. But when you listen to um, the electric guitar and you get the electric guitar in resonance, hands off. ACDC, Van Halen, these guys are some of the best. Anybody around here who plays music understands resonance, clearly. So during this song, they had to ingest something else because they didn't have enough to keep him going because the guy's a freaking maniac on the guitar. So they injected bagpipes to mask waiting for the energy to fill back up in the amps. Today, that's not true. So it's the same that we're talking about here. The linear magneto effect is also used in guitars in amplification and all this stuff. What ACDC was showing you here is not satanic rock and roll, is shit. How do we bring this free energy out to the public, make you enjoy it, understand it, but not tell you that this is what we're doing? These guys are running this whole band on very little wattage. When you look at over the years of how many lights they turned on versus how much energy that they used, they clearly were producing over unity on stage, right in front of you, in front of everybody, and nothing could stop it because they never made that claim. They made more music, more sound, more light than the energy input to the band from the grid. Once they got bigger, they started resonating against the grid. You can clearly hear when they're in Europe on three phase, it's freaking hard for them to resonate back up against that three phase grid. They're pushing their instruments harder and harder and harder and harder to build up that step charge resonance. When they're in the United States, it's cakewalk, right? Shit, they blew up enough amps. They should not have Why did they blow up amps? Because they filled them with linear energy. You, you know better than me. Right. And they just kept on pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until they can get the guitar in resonance. And you can look from the day one till today. Today, hands off, that guitar will run for 30 seconds. Not touchable. That's the linear magneto effect. That's the free energy that you're looking for put right in front of you through music for us to enjoy. Thank you. So, David and I did not need to do this this weekend. We both have lives, we both have families. This is out of our way time and our money. We both have other things to do. The whole reason we had this conference is for the sole purpose for all of you to have some understanding. It, do, there, it does work. Stan and Meyer told the truth. If you get on my forum, everything you need to know is there. Look for it. Get off your ass, understand <laughs> it, look for it. I'm done explaining people. I'm done making videos. I have work to do. David, he has work to do. We both have jobs. We have jobs to work. I personally hope to get someone to help fund 
me to finish this. I would like to give Ed Chanson his money back. Ed wants to see it done. I want to see it done. David wants to see it done. Everybody watching this wants to see it done. David is also working on something that is not Stan Meyer's technology. Possibly it is inter intertwined with it. Very similar. David is doing very exciting things with water into oil. You, whoever can contact him about that. But the specific point is both of us put this on this weekend so that all of you could get off your ass and do it. If you want it done, you do it. I'm doing it, you do it. If everybody wants to get together in six months or a year from now, yeah. we can figure that out when six months scales. If people want me to do something, and you get off your ass, post it on my channel so I can read it. The channel's there for everybody. There's 400 videos, roughly 320 that are public. There are, I hit shit, all right? Forget it, get over it. David, he hides shit. He ain't, he's not gonna do work and tell you how to be his competitor. Why would I give you everything and you never got off your ass? I'm off my ass now. I'm just looking at you because I don't want to look at everybody else. <laughs> so, why would I tell you how to do it if you didn't get off your ass and do something about it yourself? If you want to do it, speak up. All of the information has been given away to you. This conference was free. You never come. You never showed up. You never supported it before it happened. It just happened. And all of the information was given away. And that's about all I have to say about it. Thank you, Max. Thanks for being a good pen pal. I'm glad I met you in person. So we're gonna take a little bit of a break. You guys can stretch your legs and we're gonna dive into linear magnetism. We're gonna dive into it super deep. some simple electronic physics that you probably didn't learn in school and the biggest reason that people cannot replicate any of Stan Myers and stuff is because of what you learn in my opinion mowing the grass so the live stream should be running if it goes blank, if someone could touch the mouse. I don't know why it does that, but I don't know. So if we have potential differences, if we have a plate and a plate, 
you have on one side, you have a positive and a negative. The big question is, why would you have a positive and a negative on plates? Naturally occurring, just two plates in the air, two plates underwater. Two plates with any substance in between, if it's a non-conductive substance, then it will naturally want to have a positive on one side and a negative on the other side. Now, the reason is, anything that fills this space, if it's conductive, then you have a ground short between the two. If you have a ground short, you have no positive or a negative. If if this substance is non-conductive, that means it's an insulator. If this is an insulator and this plate is slightly different than this plate, it will naturally form a positive and a negative. If this is a dielectric of some kind and this is a positive and a negative potential, what do we have? Anybody? Capacitor. Close. I was going to say capacitor. <laughs> Me too. Wrong. <laughs> but right. Okay, that sucked. What do you want to hear? A charge? You got a stored charge? Is that what you want to hear? Exactly. Okay, well, speak American. A battery. A battery. Okay. A battery. okay. Okay, if you have a semiconductive material that is semiconductive, meaning maybe some of it conducts, maybe some of it's an insulator, you could have a semiconductor, you could have Forgive me, I'm tired. <laughs> the balance of four electrons. Semiconductor or a semi dielectric. Yes. Semi dielectric, semiconductive is the same thing. Okay, if you have air, you have paper, you have oil, cockroach wings. Barium titanate. Remind me of that in a few seconds. That's a good one. I'm sorry? That's a Glass. Remind me of the barium titanate. Glass. Glass. An insulator is only an insulator with holes in it. Everything has holes in it. If you have glass or anything else, it's either a semiconductor or a semi-dielectric, semi which is an insulator. As long as you have a dielectric, you have a capacitive effect. Okay, if you have a capacitive effect, it's not exactly a battery. It's not exactly a capacitor. A battery is partially a capacitor. A capacitor is partially a battery. Capacitor batteries, they're very similar. They both hold a charge that you can use to do something with. So, let's say we have two plates and we have a car battery. If it's dry and I hook my meter to a car battery, there's no acid in it, no liquid. Do I get a voltage? Yes. Uh, Chanson is correct. Because the air is a semiconductor, semi-dielectric. But no current. How are the ions passed? Not exactly true. Okay. Capacitor stores what? Static volt stores voltage. Where is the current? Not till you discharge. When you discharge it, you now have a dumped current there will be a flow. A flow is current. If you have voltage, which is not exactly current, agree? 
Anybody it's, argue with that? And make sure to say that voltage is just a, by definition, is a difference in potential, and that's it. So, if we have potential, if we have, just have two plates, back to the battery before I get to that. Once I put acid, or an alkali, or an acid, into the battery, how many volts is now on the battery? 1.5 with one cell. If it's a car battery, how many volts did I just make as soon as I put the liquid in? If you have six cells, you're going to have 12 volts. Chance it is correct. It is automatically 12 volts and how many amps, Jansen? Depends on the size of the plates. Depends on the size of your battery. Amperage. Capacitors. It depends on the size of your capacitor. So. Once you put the battery acid in the battery, you now have 12 volts at, let's say, 1,000 amps. Science tells us this is a chemical reaction. Now let me define a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is when you take two chemicals and mix them together, they react until they're gone. They change into something else, correct? What did the battery change into? A battery. Right. It's a potential, right? So we now have a battery that has a plus on one side, plus on this side, a minus on this side. We now have a battery. This is not a chemical reaction. Not a chemical reaction. This is chemical. The chemicals are ionic charge, positive and negative charge, stored in a vessel. The charge is actually stored on the plates. A battery, a capacitor stores the charge in the dielectric. Is that correct? A, a capacitor stores charge in the dielectric, is that correct? It's, I think it's passed through the dielectric and it's stored on the plate surface. The man is absolutely correct. You have a dielectric here. The voltage is actually stored here on the plate. The dielectric is just a semi-resistance between the plates. Agreed? Someone touch the mouse pad for me, please. Hunter, that's your new job. Don't ask me why it does that. I don't know. So, now the battery chemical reaction is actually chemical storage as ionic charge. Positive ions, negative ions. If you have a battery, the plates actually have little holes in them. And these holes actually add up more charge to be in the hole, more surface area for the holes. So if you have a capacitor with a dielectric in it, does it hold a charge? Yes. Where the capacitor holds the charge on the plates, the battery holds the charge on the plates, correct? until yes. it's shorted out. Any medium in between is either a semiconductor or a semi-dielectric. Does that make sense? I don't like that you use the word semiconductor. They just call it a dielectric because semiconductors, like a diode is a semiconductor, a transistor is a semiconductor. Okay, let's take what Ed just said. He's jumping ahead on me. No, I'm just trying to get prepared. That's okay. <laughs> Let's say we have a piece of gold foil, Ed, and there's a bunch of little pinholes in it. Will one side hold a charge and the other side hold a charge, a different charge? If it's in a glass Possibly shot, a positive yeah. in one side and a negative on the other side? I'm talking about a very old experiment, I would say yes. What is this thing I just described? Uh, it sounds like a Leyden jar. 
or the other uh, do the thing of Transistor. Transistor. Gold. One side is the negative, one side is the positive. A diode and a transistor, the transistor is two diodes. Excellent, very well said. The first transistor was what, Ed? A germanium. Uh, and germanium. Germanium, right. Germanium diode. Is that right, germanium? Ger yeah. Germanium diode in a certain amount of time. And at a 50% duty cycle, the on time is the same as the off time. Questions on that? Everybody follows that? So, the on time is on the positive side of a zero. This is zero volts. Negative side would be down here. So the reason I mentioned the positive side, where is the negative? Anybody know? In the ether. It's in the off time when you're not pulsing it. I believe the man's right. Yeah. This is our battery again. The positive and the negative. Wait a minute. Who is right? You. Oh. I thought he was right. What's your name again? <coughs> David. Uh, Pakta. Pakta? What kind of name is Pakta? The fucking Polish. Polish name. I love Austria. Poland. Good. I'd like to go to Poland. Buy me a ticket. You can't get a cup of coffee. They lost the water for so, risking for boiling water. <laughs> so the big question here: If you have positive on one side and negative on the other side, if I take these wires and touch them together, what happens? You clench your nuts. <laughs> What happens if I touch this wire to one terminal to another terminal on a car battery? You get a radiant wind or a short. It's going to burn. It's going to melt. It's going to burn your fingers bad. Where is the part that burns first? The least resistant. The least resistant. Where is the least resistance? Exactly. In the wire. Weakest point, the wire Weakest the point in the wire. Let's say the, the wire theoretically is completely equal conductivity in diameter. Where does it melt first? Exactly in the middle. Push the poop. I apologize. Pushta. Pushta. Exactly in the middle, he says. Other than David, who knows why that would melt in the middle? Why can't I answer? Come up here and you can answer. No, I'm good. <laughs> Other than David, why would it melt in the middle? Because two equal opposing forces, so you have to hit the middle. Equal forces. Because, equal forces because we have a negative potential and a positive potential that are equal. So it's going to meet in the middle, correct? Weakest point is going to melt. If there's no weak point, it would melt in the middle. Are we agreed? This is not what we learn in school. What happens if you hold the wire towards one side of the other? You, you get a nice, significant burn mark that you live with the rest of your life. It would melt there first. No. <laughs> Most likely, it'll melt pretty easy. Theoretically, so that it's easy to understand it's going to melt in the middle because two charges meet. I, I get that. I was just wondering what happens to the The electricity does not flow from the negative to the positive. It does not flow from the positive to the negative. It flows equally to the middle because we have a potential difference equal.
Now, back to the square wave. Positive potential. We're on the positive side of zero volts. All of Stan's work was positive side of the zero volts. If any of the paperwork you read, it's always positive potential, correct? Positive waveform. Every time you look at Stan's stuff, he talks about positive waveforms. But he never uses the word. He always calls them unipulses. Unipolar pulse strain. Right. Unipolar meaning above the zero mark. Not AC, DC, not, not, not queer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, if we take this positive potential and we put it on just this plate, positive, let's just assume there is no negative just for ease of operation. If there is no negative connection and we give it from somehow, we give it positive potential on one plate. What happens to the negative plate? Gets a negative potential. How? Um, are, the, are the wires hooked up? Let's pretend theoretically not hooked up. Where does the negative potential come from? Most of you are not old enough to know what a Germanian diode is, I bet. I did for St. Germain. The first radios used a Germanian diode, which had a rock, with, with a needle point on the rock. You move the needle around until you found a good signal on your radio. It was called a cat's whisker radio. Also a point contact diode. Point contact diode. And like you said, in a cat's whisker. So, back to our plates. If we have a point contact, more or less, one wire in the middle of the plate, we have a capacitor or a battery, right? Right. We have ionic charge of a positive or a negative. So if this plate, you put battery fluid in a battery, it's automatically full charge, right? Now you've got to charge it. You have to you put the sulfuric acid in there. You have to put, you, you put a charge on it. It is automatically 12 volt. You so charge it to- 12 volts, but you're, not, you're still going to have to get the, electro, the process going, the chemical reaction going. Once you dump the fluid in, it becomes 12 volts. Yes. You have to condition it by charging it. Correct. Correct? Yes. But it already has 12 volts in it, right? Um, yes, you'll have 12 volts. You have to train it to hold a charge. You have to train it to hold a charge. So, the reason we're talking about this is Sam Meyer's work. What was every, every part of his work? What are we all after? Efficiency. Two plates with voltage in between it. Two plates with voltage in between it with water as the dielectric. Oh, okay. And what's another name for a water fuel cell? A wa uh, the water capacitor. Water capacitor. That's another name for a water water fuel cell. It's and he calls it that in an international patent. So if you want to make Stan Myers' process, you have a dielectric between a capacitor. So where do we get the charge from? Um, the battery. High voltage pulse trans. I think it travels on the surface of the water. The elect free electrons are ionized on the surface of the water and travel over to the plate. I think you're all partially right. So, if we just dump water into this thing, we're going to get maybe 1.2 volts between each plate. Two plates set. We have to get a lot more voltage across the plates. How do we accomplish that? Battery acid is a 
good conductor and you pass amperage when you have a conductor. We don't want to pass amperage. We want to limit the amperage as much as, much as possible. So if we dump a conductive fluid like battery acid into this thing, we get a dead short. What are the bubbles that you get when you're charging the battery? That is hydrogen. Wow. <laughs> when you're charging a battery in your car, it outputs hydrogen gas, which is flammable. That's why if you're smoking, you like your, you light your lighter so you look down in the battery, it blows up in your face because hydrogen and oxygen, you just lit it. So, back to the barium titanate. Barium titanate is what they put in supercapacitors. Do you know why? It resonates naturally with the environment. The service area is really high. Very high dielectric constant. Barium titanate is, I'm not even going to explain where they get that. It, it's a, we won't go there. Is it silver oxide barium titanate? Either way. Okay. Barium titanate is used in supercapacitors because you can actually form what's called a Helmholtz layer in the barium titanate. The Helmholtz layer is a multi-layer which will store a charge. You just get more, basically you have more layers for with the barium titanate. And then a capacitor, you can add a number of plates. A battery, you add a number of plates. It's basic physics, it's real stuff. So, any questions on that part? Okay. So let's say we have our two plates over here. This is our Stanmeyer plate cell device. So we can read into Stan stuff, and we know historically he said a square wave oscillation, correct? He specifically says around five kilohertz. At a 50% duty cycle. At a 50% duty cycle. What we just said was, there's 5,000 of these pulses. Uh, you want to say your arbitrary ground? Uh, yeah, it would be. It would be creative. Let's just put the ground to dirt. Where does the, where does the negative? What, what happens to the negative plate if someone touched the mouse? What happens at the negative plate with the dirt, with the ground? Will it equalize? Will there be a negative potential form? Yeah. Yeah, the, the positive plate will suck a negative, uh, negative charge up to that other plate. If you put two plates together and one plate is negative, one plate is positive, it will equalize and the other plate will match, the both plates will match. They will equal out, Potent, equal potential. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we can make a positive pulse and we can hit the plates with a positive pulse, we're going to automatically get a negative, right? I think so. I think makes common sense, right? Generate a makes perfect common sense. I didn't understand. I, well, I heard that like a so magnet automatically has a negative side to it. So I, I figure if you have a positive, you got to have a negative. If we took a cat and we take a comb and we run that comb through that cat, what happens to the comb? Well, it's statically charged. Statically charged, positive and negative. No. no, no. Where is the other charge? In the air. In the air. What if we have lightning? 
Does lightning strike from the cloud to the ground or from the ground to the cloud? In a path of least resistance. Yeah, it goes either way. <laughs> Why does lightning strike? And that guy, right? Because Why does lightning strike? Because the kids are so large it's it's that it, it has to overcome the dielectric. Yeah. I'm sorry, David, what? Because the energy comes from the ground state first, splits the dielectric, giving a path for the positive ionosphere to attract to the ground for a second. So the ionosphere is positive and the ground is negative? Correct. So the ionosphere, ion, the sphere is positive, the ground is negative. Once the potential is met for the arc to cross the two, then you have lightning bolt. But from the space shuttle, you do see occasionally lightning does strike up into outer space. Because if you have a negative potential higher than the positive potential, then the lightning bolt would go up. If the positive potential is greater than the negative potential, the lightning bolt will go down. No, that's Reagan in Star Wars killing all the That's what you're seeing. So, if the ionosphere and the Earth were equal potentials, then, then theoretically the lightning bolt would meet the middle. Right? And the air and the Earth would be a dielectric semi-permeable dot semi-permeable dielectric but you're missing something yes you're missing Dave. a very important point yes Dave. is is they can't they're not easy i'll say this as clearly as i possibly can they're not equal in potential between the earth and the ionosphere because the ionosphere is at trillion volts we talked about volts versus frequency earlier on it's a higher frequency and the earth is a lower frequency so the potential is higher at the ionosphere and the frequency is lower at the earth so the potential of the earth its frequency is lower but the mass of the earth is greater so that you have to take frequency potential and mass to understand that equation that's why lightning comes down to the mass, because the mass has a void. The higher the frequency, the less room there is to expand that. The Earth has a bigger mass, but the void in the middle of those masses is, is greater, so that's where the energy goes into. So, he's went way past the basic okay, explanation. Okay, Sorry. You, you have that's this. okay. Everybody's, most people are familiar with the Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's and, Ladder. Right. And you Jacob's that, Ladder, two antenna, a lightning bolt in between. And as the, and when, and it climbs up until the space is so far apart that the spark can't jump anymore, and it stops, and then this the, the, repeats. But the way I'm looking at lightning is you have the clouds that are rubbing together, producing a static charge. This charge builds up to a point where it can reach a voltage potential high enough to release or discharge. And then it's gonna go ahead and ionize the air until it gets to the ground path to, you know, to, to uh, release its energy. So I'm looking at as, as the lightning exceeding a charge level that it can't hold anymore or until it breaks or ionizes the air to make a path. Wait, wait a minute, Jansen, discharge. wait a minute, Jansen. That last part, say it again with the microphone. You have the clouds rubbing together with moisture and then there's like the cone.